I think we're live now. Yes, we should be good to go now. Okay, thank go you. For it. Thanks. Uh, so welcome everyone to AFO Cafe. These are informal science conversations about all things birds. My name is Valentina Ferretti, and I'm the current president of Association of Field Ornithologists. And for those of you who are not members of AFO, um, AFO is a member-based organization, and we're focused on the study and conservation of birds and their natural habitats. And we view ourselves as the bridge between the professional and amateur ornithologists. We do have a strong focus on Latin America through outreach, scientific meetings, and grant programs. And this year, it's our 100th anniversary, and we're having a meeting in Plymouth, Massachusetts on uh, the 10th to the 13th of October, 2022. So uh, registration is still open and you're uh, welcome to participate. Actually, we have quite interesting <coughs> workshops too. Um, one, it's uh, uh, introduction to passer and banding, that's before the meeting. And it's a, a joint workshop uh, from the North American Banding Council and Manama. And then after the meeting on Friday, October 14th, uh, there's an educational um, workshop. Um, it's educational outreach for field ornithologists, how to effectively engage students of all ages during bird banding and other field work. And this is uh, being um, presented by uh, Molly Jacobs from Manomet and Amy Widensall from Mass Audubon. So they uh, promise to be quite interesting. The deadline for abstract submissions is uh, September 2nd. We extended that. So again, you still have time to submit your abstract and register. And uh, our next AFO Cafe is going to be on September 30th. and um, Paulo Zambias will be presenting uh, work on the behavioral ecology of a neotropical passerine, the grass run. Uh, so you, this is going to be a live cafe. And then in October, we're going to have an in-person AFO cafe in Plymouth uh, during the meeting. Our cafes are <coughs> sponsored by Avinet, Avinet Research Supplies, and um, Avinet provides uh, mess nets and equipment uh, to field ornithologists and also bat biologists. And if you need to purchase mist nets, uh, spring scales, uh, wing rulers, or bird bands or whatever, just go to uh, Avinet and um, you have the website there and you will certainly find those things there. And if you enjoy our uh, AFO, Cafe, you can become a member and support the continuation of these uh, events. And you can find more information about becoming a member at afonet.org. And now I'm going to introduce today's talk. Um, the talk will be presented by Valeria Ojeda and Miguel Sagese. And it's on the effects of anticoagulant rodenticides in non-target South American wildlife, the challenge of network building. Uh, but let me introduce the speakers. Uh, Valeria Ojeda, she's a researcher at INIBIOMA, CONICET. Uh, this is a CONICET <coughs> Institute in Patagonia. She was born in Buenos Aires and raised in um, Patagonia. She has broad interests in wildlife and her first steps in research included native fish and rodents. But after 2000, she engaged more and more with birds. I, I think that she actually saw the light <laughs> and she started working with birds. And by 2006, she concluded a PhD on um, the Magellanic woodpecker in Bariloche, focusing mostly on breeding biology and nest site selection. Uh, she has a stable, pos stable position at the Argentine National Research Council, this is CONICET, uh, and her pro research project is named Wildlife Conservation in the Austral Temperate Forests, Relationships with Land Perception and Management. Uh, Miguel Sagese, and I don't know, Miguel, if that's the way that you pronounce your last name, I'm hoping that that is the way. Um, yeah, you, you did very well. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> 
Thanks. Um, he's an associate professor of microbiology and avian wildlife medicine at the College of Veterinary Medicine, Western University of Health Sciences in Pomona, California. He was born in Argentina and has been living and working in the USA for 22 years. Miguel is an avian veterinarian, an ornithologist, and a microbiologist whose main focus of interest has been and still are birds of prey. He obtained his DVM degree at the University of Buenos Aires, followed by a master's degree in infectious diseases at the University of Minnesota, where he completed a residency in raptor medicine and obtained a PhD in microbiology at Texas A&M University. He has been studying raptors since 1985 and has been an active board member of many veterinary, microbiology, and ornithological professional societies, such as the Association of Avian Veterinarians and the Raptor Research Foundation. In this last one, he has been its president between uh, 2015 and 2017. Currently, he's an associate professor of avian medicine and microbiology at Western University of Health Sciences. Laura Casalins was born and raised in Patagonia. There she is. <laughs> she's a biologist and she's about to defend her dissertation from the University of El Comahue. Um, she will be working as a postdoc with Valeria and Miguel on the topic of the presentation. And she has a strong background as an avian parasitologist. And actually, her uh, the dissertation that she's about to defend is on gall parasites in lake systems in Andean Patagonia. Gala Ortiz was born and raised in Bariloche and the Andean Patagonia. She's a veterinarian, just graduated from the National University of La Plata and is the youngest member of the team. She's uh, taking her first steps in the study of wildlife and is focused on gaining exper experience as a wildlife vet veterinarian, working interdisciplinary in conservation projects. And Pablo Plaza, I think he wasn't able to be here today, but he's part of this collaboration, was raised in Buenos Aires and studied veterinary medicine in the University of Buenos Aires. <clears throat> he lives now in Luisa Langostura near Bariloche, where he obtained his PhD in biology at the Comahue University. And he's been studying for several years the effects of um, that damp produce on different species of scavenger <coughs> birds, especially focusing on black vultures and uh, exposed to toxics, toxics and emerging pathogens. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and thank Valeria and Miguel for uh, presenting. And uh, if you have questions, we can leave those to the end and um, we can um, turn our cameras on, our microphones on, and we'll have a more um, informal conversation with, with the uh, presenters. Okay, so. There you go. And now you can share your screen. Okay. What happened with this? Yes, but I, I don't find, ah, oh, here it is. Okay. Share. And let's, I necessito acceder arriba. Okay. It's okay. Everybody hear me? Okay. Great. Yes. Now I will talk to all of you with my English that I've not spoken for a couple of years. So I'm sorry for that, but this is what we have. So, well, let's go to the first. Um, well, I will tell you a little bit about the, um, the origin of this, of this presentation and this team and this work we are trying to push to to start. Um, for those that are present from Chile or Argentina, this will be uh, something that we, we know, uh, that you all know about, but not for the rest of the people, maybe of the attendants. Um, in this map, we have South America, and what we have here in a red circle is uh, the northern part of what we call the Austral Pembrate Forests. And the particular 
the, particu the particularity that I'm uh, focused on telling you is that the understory in this forest is uh, mostly dominated, it's not everywhere the same, but um, broadly or overall, it's mostly dominated by um, bamboo, bamboo plants uh, from the Chusquea genus. There are different species. And these plants have, have a particularity that they have massive blooming and flowering every tens of years of, depending on the species, maybe every 50 years, every 60 years, it depends on which species we are talking about, particularly on the Argentinian side, this is on the Eastern uh, slope of the, of the Andes chain. Uh, there's only one plant that is uh, the dominant and the flowering, this massive flowering occur every about 60 to 80 years. So it's a, it's a really important phenomena, natural phenomena that uh, is extended over maybe a hundred thousand hectares or so. So uh, what is the importance of this, of this and why, what does it have to do with us and with the, with the rodents and, and with the, their control? This is what the plants look like when they are in the, when they are not flowering, when they are in the vegetative phase. But when they flower, as I told you, they, they, the, these uh, bloomings cover extensive uh, geographic areas. On the left, what we have is uh, the plants in bloom. You have a person there and another person, very, very important persons because they have been studying rodents in South America for many years, it's the Pearson couple. Uh, and this on the, on the right, you have the plants after the blooming, all these plants die synchronously. So it's a, this brings tremendous changes in the ecosystems. But one of the most important changes is that after the blooming, we have large amounts of seeds that these plants produce and the seeds start to fall to the ground and they accumulate. And uh, one of the most uh, interesting uh, and important consequences, it's a short term consequence, but it's a very, it's a very important for humans living near humans and well, the, the whole ecosystem li living near this phenomena. And is that after these uh, seeds accumulate on the forest floor, the rodent populations that usually the native rodents and also well, there, there are some exotics, of course, now too, they increase the populations tremendously. And in the next winter, we have a cold, cold weather here, they are th their populations instead of, of reducing as they should they continue growing. So it's, uh, it's about, the, not all of these phenomena are exactly the same, but more or less. Uh, usually what happens is that we have one whole year of uh, very numerous and growing rodent populations. And this brings problems for the uh, people and, and uh, crops or all, all, all economic activities that are near this, this, um, these episodes. And also because some of these rodents are reservoirs and particularly one of them has been proved to transmit a lethal hantavirus for people, uh, to people, sorry. So <clears throat> this brings a lot of, this um, implies a lot of concern. For, for human populations around this forest when, when the bamboos have this, these blooming. Uh, in, uh, in 19, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm not seeing my entire, I need to take this bar out. Well, doesn't matter. Uh, in 2018, we have a massive flowering event near Bariloche where I live. It, it was on the Northern part of the Nahuelhuapi National Park in Neuquén province. It was not that extended compared to other, other of 
of these flowerings, but it was very, very uh, extreme. I mean, the, you see the pictures, they, um, it was really a, a kind of 100% of the plants were affected. So mm. they, they were all dead. This picture was taken in April or so, April, May, the, one, the big one. And you see there's no bamboo, no living bamboo. So it was really uh, a very massive phenomenon. So um, we had undergone other nearby of these flowering events. So we were every time a little bit better prepared to study these, these events on what we did in 19, um, in, 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 sorry, in 2018, what we did is um, many, uh, we were many uh, biologists, mostly biologists interested in studying this phenomena from different points of view or different aspects. One of them, and that's what uh, I was, I was uh, invited to this, to this study was monitoring the, the owls, the, the owls that now I will tell you why, uh, but in previous phenomena, we had observed that uh, some species behaved as eruptive and they came in, in large numbers to this, to this um, areas where the rodents ha uh, had um, outbreaks. So this, uh, this is a publication that we had on a previous episode, which had occurred on 2010, 2011 on the Southern portion of Nahuelhuapi National Park, Lago Pueblo and, and other areas. So we knew that uh, there was a, a, an interesting behavior uh, uh, related to owls that we, we uh, could study a little bit better in this event, in this new event. So what we did, this, this, um, this what is painted in yellow is areas where people were trapping rodents and were studying the whole rodent cycle. So what I did is I designed um, a own monitoring scheme that was overlapped with their sampling areas. So the idea was to study all these things together. We have not, not publish about this yet uh, because, well, not, not because of me this time, it's because uh, these people did not uh, finish their processing of the seeds. There, it's a lot of work because there were some people studying the plants too. So this is something that I will not extend on this talk, but is we are still working on these data. The inter interesting thing here to tell you is, uh, that why, why is so important that we focus on the owls in this in this events? It's because mm -hmm. of course there are other species too, but the raptors, for example, the foxes, mm -hmm. other other um, predators. But the interesting thing about the the owls is that they are the most um, important predators of rodents because. First, because they are nocturnal, like the rodents, or like most of these rodents. So uh, they, they, um, they can be more or less specialized, uh, depending on the species, on the rodents, but most of them consume rodents. This is only examples. Most pictures are from Patagonia, except this one that is from another part of Argentina, but this is real examples from from Patagonia raptors consuming uh, rodents. So we were very happy. We, there were, uh, in, when, when, the, when the owls started to arrive in large numbers, we, have, we had very happy old times. We were giving talks. There were uh, bird watching groups that made these nocturnal like excursions to see them. Everything was okay, but, the following summer of the sum, a year after this first um, uh, masting of these of these um, bamboos, something that was not happy started 
started to happen. And it was that um, owls, particularly the barn owl, started to appear there um, around, mostly around the Bishanangofura village, which was the only large village that was affected by this phenomena. And we knew about other episodes where also owls had been seen dead when the, the, there's, a, there's two phenomena. We could think, well, but the rodents started to decrease because the seed was depleted. I mean, there was no more seed in the forest, but there's another phenomenon. These rodents start to move and start to look for food outside the forest. And they approach towns and gardens and are everywhere. It's like an invasion. That's the last phase of their, of their uh, not outbreak because they are not reproducing by them, but they are too many yet and they and, and hungry. So this is the moment when people start to use whatever they they have at hand to control these rodents because it's a massive invasion around their houses, in the houses, in the cars, everywhere. So coinciding with that and with the use of lots of um, these um, rodenticides is that this owl started to be uh, found dead, every, dead and also ill. Pablo Plaza, which is not here, he received two or three of them still living. He could not save them. And well, they were severely affected, but uh, let's, I have another one. Well, and what happened is that um, we were, people in the Bishan Angostura knew I was doing this uh, old monitoring and they asked us, please tell the people not to poison the, the this was, this generated a, a big, big movement of the, from the society because they were all concerned about this. And uh, of course we could not, we had no proof that it was the, um, the poisons, but uh, there, there wasn't much coincidence between all these facts. And so we gave some, some talks with Pablo and with another veterinarian from the, um, from the county of Villa Langostura uh, to tell people not, not to use these this products, but well, um, the, the damage had been done. Okay, and I will end my, conclude my part telling you that we received about 10 um, bodies of these owls that were in more or less good, good condition, but the reports on dead owls were over 40 in different parts of Bisha Langostura. Most of them were found really in, in very bad condition. Uh, I mean, several days after, after death, so they, they were useless for, the, for studies. But now um, Gala will tell us about what we did with some of the ones that came to, to Bariloche in, a, in an acceptable um, condition to be studied. Well, okay. okay. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Perfect. Well, I am going to tell you a little bit about the work that we did in the beginning of year 2020. We performed necropsies on seven Tito Alba carcasses, fresh carcasses, uh, in order to take TISO samples for later analysis, but also to try to determine it the cause of death or try to approach the cause of death. Um, because of this is that we perform an acute necropsy in which first we search the carcasses for external lesions and alterations that could tell us anything about the animal. And then to approach a colomic cavity, we started by making an incision on the ventral median line. And when we were approaching the internal organs, we checked the skin, the subcutaneous tissue, and the muscles, searching for hemorrhages or other uh, lesions that could tell us what happened with the different animals. And once that we were in the 
corporal cavity. We checked for position, size, and macroscopic appearance of the different organs than to, to check if we could see any lesions. And then we also opened the cranial vault of the animals in order to check the encephalo. Um, during all of these procedures, we took samples from liver, stomach, small intestine, and also brain for later analysis. And um, can you pass? Great. Um, the findings, the data that we obtained was basic because it's what we could see there when we opened the different animals, but we can definitely check that all the animals had a very poor corporal condition. The big muscular masses were very, very little, and there were no adipose tissue at all in the different animals. And the findings that could be explained because of the poisoning with anticoagulant rodenticides that we found were diffuse bleeding in the different arteries of the brain that you can see in the pictures below. And we also found profuse bleeding in the lungs of some of the animals. And we found also dark uncoagulated blood in the colomic cavity of some of the animals too. Those are the findings that can be explained for anticoagulant rodenticide poisoning, but we are not sure yet. Okay, Miguel, uh, you, you want to share your screen? Hi, hello everybody. Yes, uh, thank okay. you, Valeria. Thank you very much, uh, Gala and Valeria. It will be difficult for me to match your English skills. Uh, you have a wonderful English, believe me. I'm not sure I can really match that, but we'll do my best. So yeah, if we can share, let me see if I can share. Should be this one, I guess. Can you see it there? Yes. Is that showing? Perfect. So again, okay. thank you very much, uh, Valentina and and FFO for giving us this opportunity to, to talk. And, and thank you, uh, my friends and collaborators, Valeria, Laura, Gala, and Pablo for, um, for everything and for letting me be here today discussing a little bit this specific aspects. As, as Valeria and Gala were saying, uh, in the event of a mortality situation or a die off of many, many, many uh, individuals, we can always think about a few things, you know, that you can always have many causes of mortality. We know very well raptors, they can die from many different things. But the point that when you have so many dying in a short period of time, this usually points out in, in most species to infectious agents, or infectious or parasitic agents, uh, outbreaks, like some viruses, for example. But, but it's very unlikely that there will not be other birds affected. Then you have specific uh, pesticides that can also affect uh, avian species and many other animals in a short period of time. And raptors, you know, they are exposed to many different types of food, so there are always possibility for that. But as Gala mentioned in the, in the necropsy findings, there were really strong evidence for looking at rodenticides. And, and we know that the list is very long, you know, any pesticide, this strict nine, uh, organophosphates, carbamates, many different pesticides can kill animals in a short period of time when they are exposed to them. But in this particular case, we will focus on the rodenticides. That's not because we know 100% sure that that was what killed these birds, but it was one of the very likely differential diagnosis, maybe one of the most important rollouts. And that's where the story begins also for us because we, got, we, we found in trouble and we will discuss this later, but we were unable to really investigate that particular um, cause. So the idea was, well, let's discuss a little bit 
anticoagulant rodenticides, do a brief review, and then we will be able to discuss uh, what's the situation in South America and in, in Argentina, of course, but in, in, in South America and, and other countries in Latin America, comparing what we know in other countries. We, we are very limited in our abilities to diagnose infectious diseases, parasitic diseases, and uh, pesticide poisoning in, in wildlife in our region. So this was a typical example where we were in front of a wall that we couldn't move forward at some point. So basically what I'm going to discuss today or present today is, is just a brief review about the issue of anticoagulant rodenticides. And there are a lot of information out there that you can find in PubMed, P-U-V-M-E-D, that is a very, very strong uh, and very helpful database, also in Google Scholar and many biological uh, search engines. But if you are interested, you can really take a look on the last conservation letter from the Journal of Raptor Research that basically provides the most uh, important, I think, information about raptors and anticoagulant rodenticides. And there is a very interesting book that just came out a few years ago, and I think it's even available online now, Anticoagulant Rodenticides and Wildlife, where there is a lot of information there if you are interested in knowing more. But as you know, oh, another slide that I have a problem. I'm so sorry about that. Let me see if I can fix it. I hate it. There you go. I saw that I checked it. Even Dr. Ojeda told me about it. So anticoagulant rodenticides is just another treat or threat, sorry, for raptors worldwide. And we have many poisons out there. And we, we are very familiar about this problem when we look at North American, European, sometimes Asian and Australian raptor species. But this is very, it's almost non-studied problem in South, South America and most of Latin America too. And as you know, uh, this adds to all the different conservation threats raptor have, this is another one. It's another piece of the puzzle when you are trying to deal with all the conservation issues these raptors are exposed to. So raptors usually get exposed to these rodenticides by secondary poisoning. So in other words, by ingesting contaminated prey, could be rodents, could be some other species as we will see, or even carrion. And the truth is that when you look at the literature available for North America, Europe, Asia, Australia, most studies are showing that basically every raptor, every population under study, it has been exposed to anticoagulant rodenticides. And this level of exposure is usually very, very high. So as, I, as we say, uh, we are not, this is not new for us. If we are into raptors, we are very familiar with all the, the potential threats, threats. And as you know, uh, raptor uh, rodents have been uh, having a relationship with humans for a long, long time since the, 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 the beginning of um, you know, uh, human communities even in caves or in the first cities associated with food. So there is a long list of products out there that have been used worldwide to kill rodents. Thallium, cyanide, fluoracetamide, strychnine, zinc sulfide, and organophosphates and carbamates, for example, carbofuran, many others. But the list has been always very long. But the problem is these um, uh, products are uh, usually associated with uh, specific events, and many of them are no longer used for this purpose. So this, the problem didn't disappear. There are still a lot of uh, situations where pest control is necessary, as we will see. And since the late 1900, or sorry, 1800, uh, with the discovery of some of uh, products, and in 1920, with the discovery of warfarin, an anticoagulant, uh, substance, uh, they have been used uh, to control, to kill rodents. And basically this anticoagular rodenticide, what they do is that they prevent coagulation. We will discuss it in a few minutes, but basically the blood doesn't clot, doesn't coagulate, and these animals die. This 
anticoagulant rodenticides belong basically to uh, two main groups, hydroxycumarins and indanedions, that you can see the formulas for them. And I'm not sure why the changes in the, in the spelling, but you can see that these are the main groups and there are a lot of variations around them, what makes the different components. When we look at them in the way they behave or uh, the mechanism of action, we know that the first generation, because they were the first one being used, they usually uh, do not kill the rodent immediately. They require several doses and the animals need to be ex uh, exposed repeatedly to these uh, rodenticides. And rodents are very smart. They usually taste food. If they don't like it, they end up not going again to this source of food. And they were not, they were slowly being replaced by the second generation of what people call super warfarins, uh, like rodifacum, bromadiolon, dienfenacum, and difetaliolon, that usually in these cases, one single dose is enough. When, once the rodent try these um, uh, baits with this particular uh, poisons, they will ingest enough, even if they don't go back to the same source of food, and they will eventually die. Usually they do not die immediately, but with one single dose in the period of five days, seven days, 10 days, more or less, they will eventually die. And they usually, they don't really taste bad. They don't have any taste or they taste good and they are mixed with some other food so, or, or, or baits. So in this way, they are quite well accepted by rodents. So in this belongs, these are the two main groups and these are the, the culprits for uh, anticoagulant rodenticide poisoning in raptors. And people use them for a lot of purposes. I think we can imagine a lot of them, the list is very long, you know, in farming for any kind of crop, uh, even feedlots, when they have these thousands of cows in short spaces, there is so much food there. Everything that provides food contributes to rodents, particularly rat, mice, uh, overgrowth. So somehow they try to control them by using these poisons in grocery stores, in food suppliers, uh, even at home botanic gardens, wineries, restaurants, uh, flour milling companies, they are used everywhere. And you can imagine any situation, any crop, any place where rodents can thrive and survive and they will be there. So when we look at the raptors living in these areas, whatever if it's in the city, urban raptors or raptors living in the middle of the Pampas agroecosystems of Argentina, you will find them, you will find them they will be exposed to them. Even more, uh, there is a very interesting article, you know, uh, people growing marijuana illegally and trying to protect the marijuana plants by using rodenticides. Well, raptors living there they have been exposed to, I put this as a, a, a unique note, you know, about how, how widespread this is. Imagine in South America, where so many crops are being produced, so many, coffee, oranges, corn, you name it. Whatever food is being cultivated, whatever type of food or animal production is there, there will be a lot of food for rodents, particularly rats, mice, and rodenticides will be used or poisons will be used. Even in zoos, many zoos, they try to keep controls uh, in low numbers and, and they rely on, on rodenticides. So this is even very common for, for birds being in captivity or held in captivity, you know, even raptors like condors, they have been uh, reported, there are reports of condors affected by anticoagulant rodenticides, even in captivity, you know, by eating the rats that they were exposed to this particular anticoagulant rodenticides. Unfortunately, raptors are not the target species and many other species are not the target or they are not the blanco, the species that we are trying to affect. We know raptors eat rodents and many other mammalian, avian, reptile species, even snails. So it doesn't matter what is the source of food for raptors. And it's not only a problem that will affect uh, those that they eat rodents, even insectivorous birds or those that eat reptiles. There are many ways that they can get exposed in secondary form or tertiary form 
to some of these rodenticides. For example, I think this is a, it's not very well defined, but uh, this author, Home et al., uh, they provide this uh, figure in a recent paper. And, and basically what happened is even if it's in the woods, in the national park where they try to keep rodents under control or in a crop or in the city, insects, birds, reptiles, rodents, they can get access to these baits with the anticoagulant rodenticides. They may or may not be affected, but they accumulate and they can be passed or transferred to a primary predator or to a secondary predator. If you are a snake and you prey upon a rodent and then you are a snake eagle that feeds upon snakes, you will get exposure to anticoagulant rodenticides. And of course, some species are very, very, uh, you know, specialized like black kites or white tailed kites or many other, or owls preying upon rodents. And these rodenticides, they are not only tasty for rats and mice, they are tasty for a lot of wild rodents that they are not affected or they are, they are not a, plur, a problem, they are not a plague. Although as, uh, Valeria mentioned before some uh, situations like the one that happened in, in, in Patagonia, but also with many other canes in, in South America, in the forest, many of them, they also have a similar behavior. When there is a rodent uh, explosion, people don't discriminate too much, you know? So they start using these baits and you can see the, I, I live in California and, and you can see these boxes with poison inside everywhere. And the one on the right is in the, apartment complex where I live. There are a lot of them. It's very difficult to 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 dig and modify this situation, but we will discuss this later. But this is how they are being used everywhere. So there's a problem that we know about it in many other places in the world, but in South America, very little. And it has been kind of neglected for some reason. Well, same situation here with the anticoagulant rodenticide. I apologize for this. I fixed it and it's still showing. Not sure why. So how these anticoagulant rodenticides work? They work by basically preventing the clotting cascade. Blood cannot coagulate. And this is a very conserved mechanism in vertebrates. So vitamin K is an important uh, component that um, regulates the synthesis of many coagulation factors. These anticoagulant rodenticides they inhibit the vitamin K. And in the end, to make it simple, several factors involved in the coagulation cascade, like factors two, seven, nine, and 10, they are no longer working well. So in, when this happens, what occurs is that the clotting mechanisms do not work. There is no coagulation. So any animal exposed to these anticoagulant rodenticides to certain level, when they reach threshold, they start to bleed. They can easily have non-traumatic hemorrhages. If the bear is hit by a truck, of course, there will be some bleeding somewhere. But when there is no really a trauma and you see this hemorrhage occurring without any explanation, you see internal bleeding, as uh, Gala was showing in some of the pictures, this is the typical example of this is what typically happens. Eventually, animals develop anemia together with the, uh, the capillars also in the tissues, they are affected and there is more bleeding and hemorrhage everywhere. And this affects everything, every single organ. Every organ can end up being affected as the brain, the liver, and this causes organ failure. Eventually, animals will die. So for those that they are into the intrinsic mechanisms, remember coagulation has uh, it can be started by multiple routes, mm, an intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, but they all end up in one single pathway where the final proteins that they are in an, let's say in an inactive way, in an active uh, uh, status, we don't want coagulation to happen without any reason. We want coagulation to happen when we have a trauma, a wound or some bleeding somewhere. When these proteins, can no longer be activated because all these uh, uh, components of the coagulation cascade are not working properly, then 
uh, what happened is that they cannot prevent and they start bleeding. So the problem is that in South America, at least, at least well, let's start with Argentina because it's where we know more about many, many raticides and uh, rodenticides are being sold. Uh, the ANMAT, that is the uh, National Administration for Medication, Food and Medical Technology, provides the list of all the products uh, sold in, in the country. And there are more than 50, including most of the second generation uh, anticoagulant rodenticides like bromadiolone, brodifacum. We also have first generation like warfarin. And we all even have flocumafen and uh, some others that people can go and even buy them in Mercado Libre. Mercado Libre is like the South American eBay. The problem is not the presence of these products. In many countries, they are only used by professionals that they, and they have very specific regulations. Like, uh, uh, for example, in the US, now in California, I think it's uh, um, ahead of everyone else because they are really trying to control even more second generation anticoagulants. And there are some uh, bills being passed about. But the truth is that you, when, Enforcement is weak and there are not really a lot of ways to control this. These products can be sold everywhere. So if I want to go and buy some of these products, I probably can do it without really too much difficulty. You find a lot of different products online. And that's what happened also in many places where they are used widely without any restriction. People go to the, we call it ferreteria. The ferreteria is like the Home Depot or in a tiny, in a small um, proportion, but people can go there and buy these products without any complication. So how do we evaluate, uh, how do we test animals for anticoagulant rodenticides? How do we know? And that's when the problem started for us, no Valeria? When we try to find, okay, we want to test these owls in Argentina for anticoagulant rodenticides. We check it with many toxicology labs, we asked the people in toxicology labs and we realized that no one in Argentina was able to test for all these different rodenticides. You need high performance liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry to test these products. And, and that's not a problem. The problem is you need to have validated these technologies. You need to have the experience. You need to have controls. You need to have, a, you know, experience to do that. It's not like I can say, okay, I can start doing this in my lab. I have a a chromatograph and a mass spectrometer, and I will do this tomorrow. No, no, you really need to have training, experience, and validation from uh, international uh, labs association. But this is how we test them. And unfortunately, in Argentina, there is no lab who can do that. The anticoagulant rodenticides, and to try to start uh, speeding up a little bit the talk, you can test them basically in liver, what is the great place because they bioaccumulate and you can see chronic exposure to rodenticides, to anticoagulant rodenticides by testing the liver. But the disadvantage is that you need to have access to an animal and get the liver or a piece of the liver. So you can really um, do that with animals that are found dead, but not very easy to do it in live animals. It can be done and, and we can talk in another time about it, but by liver biopsies. But the other possibility is to test them in blood in blood, the only problem is the short life of these products is not really too long. Uh, the half-life, sorry, the, is very short. So basically, it's very difficult to uh, detect chronic exposure to rodenticides, anticoagulant rodenticides, by looking at blood. Although you can identify recent exposure and more interestingly, in animals that they are clinically affected, there seems to be a good correlation with that. But if the animal is not yet clinically affected, you cannot find it. And of course, there are a lot of individual variation depending on the species, the amount of anticoagulant rodenticides ingested, the age, they tend to accumulate. And it's, you know, the older the animal, the more exposure, probably you will find higher levels. So that's the effects of bioaccumulation. In raptors, basically, you know, most of times you will not even realize that these animals are being exposed. But for those that you can take a look on them and see them closely, you will realize that sometimes blood doesn't clot as quickly. There is a test called protrombin time that is being used in veterinary medicine and human medicine, but it has not been enough validated for raptors. And remember, 
we talk about raptors, but we are talking about different species. A dog and a cat are quite different. So imagine when we are dealing with 350 species of birds of prey. Uh, but you may see unjustified hemorrhages, paleness, regenerative anemia, uh, increase in capillary permeability, bleeding in celomic cavity, thoracic cavity, eventually all end up in hypoxia, that is lack of oxygen, damage to the organs and organ failure and death. Uh, you can explore mucosas in the oral cavity and you may see some areas of paleness. You may even see some small spots of hemorrhage called petechias or ecchymosis. You may, you may see obvious bleeding coming out from the nerves or maybe in the thoracic cavity, you may see clots or hematomas. There are many subtle signs that you may identify. Uh, but usually this is something we can do when we have the birds in our hand. And the question is, okay, this is when we see an animal in our hands, probably because there is some reason uh, why the animal is in our hand. But in the wild, these animals are still being affected probably in a sublethal way. Veterinarians, we talk about subclinical, Biologists talk about sublethal effects. And the, imagine anemia, weakness, lethargy. Uh, when these rodents are affected, they modify their behavior. They become more easily prey to raptors. So if they modify the behavior by being exposed to anticoagulant rodenticide, and I will if I am poisoned, raptors will have probably the same problems. They will having less hunting success, they will be more susceptible to predation by other raptors. They may not fly well. They may be weak. They may not hunt as frequently, or they may not even hunt. So there may be a lot of different effects. And still, we don't know too much about them. There are some recent articles, but not too much. So many raptor species are affected. And in Argentina, we have a lot of different species, more than 80 raptors. And many of them are uh, rodent eaters. Uh, obligate, facultative, uh, you know, but they prey upon these rodents everywhere in the whole country. And the same happened in South America. So the idea is we need to start studying this problem. And, and, and I think that we need to do that by uh, identifying the problem, recognizing the problem, and we can do it in dead birds, we can do it in free ranging live birds, but we are still all affected by the same problem. You know, the, the problem of what is, how we do that if we don't have this um, technology available. There are a lot of limitations to export uh, samples overseas or to some other countries by, you know, the risk of infectious disease transmission. And you can collect samples, blood samples, and obtain the plasma or serum and uh, sorry, uh, sterilize them and send them. But remember, blood is not really the best way to, you need to submit tissues. And this makes really things very complicated. One more thing I want to say before I stop talking is that we still don't know too much about population effects, but being so widespread distributed this problem in raptors where they have been investigated, it really makes us think that they are obvious uh, problems and population effects. And there is a recent article that this is the first one that provides evidence of potential regulation, uh, population limiting effects on of anticoagulant rodenticides on, on a raptor species, the common clusters in the UK. It's a very interesting article, but we have many species that can be affected. And when you look at the whole picture of threats for raptors, and this just make up numbers, no, but habitat loss, West Nile, influenza, trauma, whole leg traps, string nine, rodenticides, everything add. And rodenticides is one other piece of the puzzle in the chain of conservation threats on, or the line of conservation threats that we still don't know too much. And, and that's where we need to start. We want to start changing this by spreading the word and, and discussing maybe what can be done. So I think that I will stop here, otherwise I will make this too long, but I would like the, the floor to Valeria and Gala and everyone else to, to share their ideas. So Valeria, Laura, well, can I speak? I would like to know, um, well, I, you, you let me thinking, but 
I would like to know among the presence who is from neighboring countries and and shares or has the feels they have the same situation, what they know. We made a little bit of change with Chilean colleagues the last days, and we could find out that in Chile, the situation is more or less the same. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the the topic has not been really, I don't, I don't wanna see, I don't want to say neglected, but it's not it's not uh, civilized or put in like um important topic, maybe because we simply didn't realize it, it is important. But uh, what about the rest of the countries? Is there people from other countries around? Mm. So <clears throat> Miguel, if you want to stop sharing your screen, I think that then we can uh, see. All the people. And we have some comments. <laughs> yeah. We had some interesting comments. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. So Betsy says that in Chile, unfortunately, the wildlife rehab centers receive a high percentage of patients intoxicated by rodenticides all year round and principally raptors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I, um, if you, all in the audience would like to turn your cameras on and um, we can talk a little bit about this. Um, I, I was wondering, because I think this is a, a, an important problem, but at the same time, in the case of Patagonia, where you have the, the hantavirus and the host for hantavirus, and that's a threat to the human population there, how, do we deal with these two things? <laughs> because there's an actual threat to the human population and there's a threat to the raptor population or the avian population or just fauna. So uh, how do we deal with this? Um, Can I? One, one interesting thing is that uh, this when these episodes or rodent outbreaks occur, there's no increase in the cases of um, hunter virus. Okay. That's very interesting because why is that? Because one may say it's because everybody uses these products and kills the rodent. No, it's because the, the, the authorities have the people really aware of the problem and the people is careful about not having contact with the rodents. There are many, many ways where, for example, the, the problem is not for the really urban areas, is the outskirts where yeah. the houses are intermingled with trees and the parks have lots of elements of the natural forest matrix. So at those areas, there are a series of measures that can be taken and that should be taken, but most of the time when we have no ratadas, that's the, that's the name here for these outbreaks, when we are not in the ratada situation, most people is lazy about those preventive uh, measures. But when we are approaching a ratada, which can be known a year in advance, so you know one year before you will have the ratada because of the flowering, it's a process that lets you get prepared. So if you are not lazy, you will probably have no contact with those rodents because there are, how do you say, sanja? Like something that you... you hmm? A ditch. A ditch, yes. Ditches. There are many, many low-tech uh, like strategies for around the houses at the places that can have real problems, not in the, in a, I don't know, in a building, in a fourth floor or, or so. Yeah. So what we need, I think, with regard to your question is work on cultural patterns. Mm -hmm. We need to, I will not say have those ditches all the time, or but if you have combinations of certain practices in at home, like, not having all your mosqueta bushes, that's an exotic plant, for example, that rodents like a lot. If you clean your, your garden from those exotic plants, if you, there are several measures that if you are more or less 
if you keep your house in order, you will not have these problems with the wild rodents that transmit the hunter virus. That is not the, the rats or what. Well, a rat can transmit other things. Mm -hmm. But for example, here, we don't have big problems with rats. It's mm -hmm. uh, We have problems. There are some localized problems. But the, the fear is of this colilargos, which is a, is a species that has been studied very well. And I think there's evidence on how to manage the, the, the house environment. So you, you reduce your contact with these rodents in a much more friendly way than getting the, the whole place full of these yeah. products. Um, but it needs a cultural change and work and informing people. Yeah. So, yeah. Georgina, you have a question if you want to. Uh, I, I can read it, but given that you're here, <laughs> if you want to. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask if uh, what do you think is the best method or the best way to control a population of rats? in a closed environment like Iceland. Because I work uh, in Iceland and it is a closed environment because um, mammals cannot leave the island, but uh, birds can and actually do. So if there's movement between the islands, um, I think it's a very complicated um, dynamic of of the of the all the um, events happening so what do you think is not using uh redentified that, that's a very complex question and probably it requires that's a world of one hour discussion. discussion depending what island you are talking about what is the wildlife population there if you have uh, uh, rodent eaters or not uh, what type of poison you want to use or, or other see other other approaches i will not say i am an specialist in rodent control i work with raptors that basically i can tell you maybe and we can discuss this later but uh, there are always a risk if you have raptors in a place there are so many things that need to be done it's, it's not a very easy answer the problem always we need to think here is that we are discussing rats doesn't matter if it's a colilargo <laughs> and oligorosomies or a, a different rodent for the general public, for most people, for my mother and for many other people, governments, uh, agencies, no agencies, but uh, politicians, they are all rats. And the main issue is not that we are not having alternatives to the use of pesticides. And sometimes pesticides are the, the, the maybe the answer when they are well uh, handled. But it's not what we ideally want to do. But it becomes very difficult to deal otherwise. The, the, the issue here is that you need to have the, the willingness. Societies, politicians, uh, uh, people who make the, the decision makers, they need to have the willingness to address these problems. For example, some countries are addressing this problem by enforcing the regulations on the use of rodenticides, by educating people, by having research done, monitoring approaches to be sure that there are no uh, problems associated with the use of these products. Some other countries, there is nothing really controlled, no one controlling these problems. There is no <coughs> enforcement. There are no really strong wildlife agencies that may be able to to monitor or, or evaluate what's going on with wild animal populations. So there are different situations. And I would say that in most cases in South America, as far as I know for what I told with friends and colleagues from other countries, the situation is always pretty much the same, no? So um, the issue of hantavirus or Andean virus or Hunin virus is in many different places where rodents are involved, it requires rodents control, ecological um, or changes or modifications to the habitat to reduce the number and education. And without that, 
very difficult to deal with the problems. And I think that in, in Argentina and many other countries, sometimes in South America, the, the, the problem is always the same, the lack of this type of network of uh, activities mm -hmm. to help control this uh, problem. So the first thing, in my opinion, to do is to start making noise, re trying to promote and, and, and let know people about this problem, uh, how wildlife can be affected by the use of rodenticides, where you put this on the table and people start talking about it, then you receive the attention from law enforcement, politicians, uh, wildlife managers, the general public. And this is why we wanted to, to talk about this today, to, to start spreading the word, because in South America, there are not really too much work done or almost zero done. And one of them, the reason is the lack of infrastructure. I was surprised about Betsy's comment. I don't know if you, Valeria, Laura, Gala, uh, read it, but she said that in Chile, they are uh, testing for anticoagulant and rodenticide. It would be great to know because we were talking with some colleagues here and, and so far as we know, they are not really, uh, no, nobody seems to be testing for this rodenticide. So we wonder how they are really evaluating this. Uh, it, it would be nice to know because we don't have this luxury in Argentina, luxury to, to be able to test for rodenticide yet. So um, that would be interesting to know. And, and the truth is that we need to start putting this on the table for researchers, people working with raptors, they need to start taking a look on this problem and this threat as in with many other ones that raptors have. But also we need to start getting public attention and the attention of um, politicians and policy makers. And so we can maybe start discussing this also with the manufacturing companies, with the sellers, the people involved in the use of this poison. They will not disappear. And, and that's what not most countries are doing. They are just enforcing and trying to um, make strong regulations so this doesn't go into the hands of the public. Because the problem, I think, in, in, in Patagonia, what was, is that everyone can go and buy whatever they want. You buy, you have all these products that yeah. you can find in the Argentinian uh, list of rodenticides, and you can get them. That's the truth, you know, legally or not legally. Yeah. Valeria, Laura, or oh, Jen has a question. Jen has a question, yes. Yeah, hey, great talk, everyone who's involved. Super appreciate it. Uh, so um, I'm really interested in thinking kind of beyond kind of us scientists and thinking about the human dimensions of uh, this subject. And so um, some work in my lab right now, we're doing kind of those, we're trying to uh, start doing those kind of things with Eris, who's in the room. And um, I think to make changes about use, we need to think about values, attitudes, wildlife value orientations, and those kind of things of people. And it sounds like it's really complex where you are with, especially with things like hantavirus, right? And um, we, those problems do exist in in North America, but maybe not to the same extent. I'm not. <laughs> that's not my field. So I don't know that. But at the same time, uh, people here, uh, some people don't value raptors, right? And so I was wondering kind of where you are, what is the uh, general attitudes or perceptions of raptors? And uh, how is that affecting getting people to, to change their behaviors in terms of providing uh, rodenticides? Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. I, I can't. Like in the what we found here in the south of the Argentina, at least, it's very different than in other parts of Argentina. We most people will not have a bad perception on raptors and they value raptors, but, but they know nothing about the effects of their rodenticide. So there is like a break breakdown between the what they think about the raptors, they are they are superb and but they don't know they are poisoning the raptors. They have no idea because these products, because nobody told us about the effects of these products in the, in the food chains. So, and the bioaccumulation and all these things that Miguel has been telling us. So for me, one of the things that we need is to inform the people mm -hmm. about, because it's not only for the birds of prey, it's 
uh, well, I regret Pablo is not in the top. Pablo is a, is a vet that has, for many years, he had a, how do you call veterinaria de pequeños animales, Miguel, in English? Like Small animal clinic. Small animal practitioner. Small animal clinic, and he had many, many and permanent patients, cats and dogs that he received that were affected. Some of them that were small sized and were really ill. So, and, and some of them that died. So it's not only a matter of, of, of the birds of prey, it's, it's also domestic animals and it's also kids. It's, it's very, we've been searching literature about human medicine and there's almost nothing in South America, but there, there are cases, there are case reports, mm -hmm. but not even in the, in the forensic sciences, they are not testing this. It's incredible. I asked um, a doctor, I, I sent him an email because I saw a, um, an abstract in a, like in a meeting. And I said, but did you test for this? No, we did not because these persons, these were persons that consumed these products for as for suicide. And because they, in the end, they were saved. So we didn't, we didn't need to. But, and I say, well, why, what will you do if the person is dead? Because some other person killed it with this yeah. product, right? And you suspect, oh no, that's a, that's a legal thing. And probably the samples will be sent somewhere abroad to another country. And say, I can't believe this. It was like not even in the human health, we are aware of this. I mean, we, the population, of course, toxicologists and, and, and the human doctors that are the um, medicine doctors that are uh, aware of this problem, but, but not the population in general. And I have a couple of things that I want to answer, Georgina. Uh, maybe I was thinking, maybe in your particular case, the use of these products will be justified. The, what is we need to, but you need to think is ways to prevent that raptors will, raptors or predators will have access to those dying and dead animals. Maybe, I don't know, I, I, I think it's, dif I know it's difficult. But because one of the problems is, is that the animals do not die immediately at the site, they consume mm -hmm. this poison, so they move. So, well, but I think that um, there, maybe there's a way that you can control where they move, they can, I don't know how, but uh, for me, maybe, maybe it's the, the problem is not uh, using the, the rodenticides, but how you control the access of these predators, maybe. And Betsy is in the meeting or is she, or she is no more here? Yeah, um, she is. And I was answering her because I, I, I was very surprised about that they say that they can test these anticoagulants in Chile. And it will be really important to know their experience and what are they doing, how they achieve that. and. You know, what can we learn from, from their experiences? That, but uh, I was surprised that many of our Raptor friends, uh, they, they say that there were not these capabilities in Chile. So it will be interesting to know more about that eventually, because it's very important, especially for us yeah. in Argentina, at least, or for those in Argentina. But this is still a problem in, in, in many places in South America. Remember, we, we are very... Uh, strong in, in production of crops and food for all the world, whatever if it's coffee for my coffee here uh, from Starwoods or for corn and, and wheat and soy that we export to everywhere. So they are really being used a lot in all these different places in Brazil, in Chile, in Bolivia. There are so much, so many rodentis have been used today at, that, at this time in, in, in South America. And we need to start talking. And I think this, uh, this event is great to, to put us in contact. I, I, if you don't mind, I would like to take a picture of all you and, and, and maybe get your names. And maybe Valentina can help us to give us a list later. And we can yes. uh, start I, I was about sharing. to ask that. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Miguel, well, can you so, for, so that you you know, um, we are um, recording this and we are live streaming it on YouTube, but it's um, all the talk is going to be available on our Wonderful. YouTube That will be great. Channel. So we can maybe start communicating and, and Betsy, I see you Hi. there. Uh, yes. <laughs> you. I don't know if it's okay if I can butt in, but it's a really yes. interesting talk. And um, well, actually uh, I work with the different uh, wildlife rehab centers and it is one of the major causes in which we receive the patients all year round, um, in some areas more than other. And basically it's because all these rodenticides are allowed. I mean, anybody can go and buy them at a hardware store, at the supermarket, or even the Ministry of Health allows it. I mean, there are companies that go and they set them up in your homes or in the farms or wherever. So uh, more than welcome to, uh, Put you in touch. I put my email in the in the chat and uh, send you the papers or the publications and the information. Uh, what basically happens is that when we do receive these patients, uh, basically raptors and the different, there are over twenty uh, around twenty four different wildlife rehab centers throughout our country, and we're all in touch on a daily basis. We have this WhatsApp. We share, you know, the, the, every single case and the problems. And uh, a couple of our vets are really um, experts in raptors. So uh, the first test they do is protrombine, of course, and see the effects of anticoagulants in the blood. And that's how they start by um, you know, applying the treatment that is necessary, of course. So, uh, you know, loads of vitamin K and so forth and, and the way to go on. And Fortunately, well, I wouldn't know the percentage of survivability of these patients, uh, but the different centers, uh, they have their own statistics. There are a couple of publications. Well, I'll look up for you and send any of you that can send me your email. And uh, sure, I mean, more than happy to address this issue, you know, in a joint effort because it's something that has to be addressed, definitely. Yeah, that, that would be great. I am also a raptor veterinarian. I work with raptors for a long, long time. And, and I didn't want to, I stopped the presentation. I didn't want to talk about treatment or anything because probably it's not the, 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 the right audience. But I, my question for you, Betsy, is when you say that they are diagnosing anticoagulants, are they really doing a clinical diagnosis as we usually can do? Or are you, what the question here for us is, do you have the facilities to test for anticoagulant rodenticides and confirm your diagnosis? The specific specifics, well, protrombine test, that's immediate. So that's what the minute they go into the rehab center, that's one thing. That's like the quick diagnosis. Um, later on to identify the specific one, that, that I have to look into because some of our rehab centers belong to different universities. So there, of course, they have the facilities uh, you know, more elaborate labs and, and testing and so forth. They belong to different faculties of veterinary medicine. Um, those are at least five of the rehab centers. So I can look into that as well and give you the statistics of who's doing what and where. Yeah, that, that will be important because most raptor veterinarians, obviously, we will be able to, to suspect when we have a exactly. population problem, basically based on the clinical presentation and signs. The key issue for us here, and, and uh, at least when you really want to, you want to really uh, identify evidence-based medicine, right? And right. evidence-based research. So to confirm the presence of anticoagulant rodenticides, it's first is quite expensive. For example, here in the U.S., it's around one hundred fifty dollars each sample, mm -hmm. and it requires really very specific laboratories that they need to they run this test very frequently so you can really keep that technique ongoing and and I, I i would really love to know that some university in chile is doing this and that there is opportunity to evaluate uh, and confirm this problem in raptors and many other species and as uh, valeria was saying you know people can can use this uh, illegally in criminal situations, and there is no way that can be confirmed. So that will be very interesting to know if you can do us this favor and find out 
I am also in connection with many veterinarians in Chile, and I, I, I wasn't aware of that. So that will be great to know that you, they can do that. Because we say there are a lot of evidences for that, but All what right. we need is to really confirm the problem, right? Gotcha. Uh, so I think that maybe you can, um, we can add your email addresses if you agree with that to the AFO website where people can link and look at the YouTube or maybe the YouTube, uh, Matt will know, is Matt here or disappeared? <laughs> I don't know, uh, but maybe, oh yes, he is here. Uh, so maybe we could put it either on our website or on the YouTube channel, the link, the description and um, ask people to uh, send information if they have some, some information to share or if they want to join the network for observations or whatever, I think that might be also something that you might want. Yes, can I? Er, 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 oh, Some there's, er, yeah, we have Eris uh, lifting her hand. Okay, okay. okay. I'll try to go real quick. <laughs> um, so I just wanna say thank you to um, Miguel and Valeria for all the work you're doing and everyone else involved, um, really appreciate it. This, Topic is very close to my um, heart because I uh, just finished my master's on this, um, and so it's something that I'm, you know, com completely obsessed with. But I really want to uh, just thank you for your work you're doing. But um, uh, I guess I just wanted to say a few things. Um, one of them, I just wanted to agree with Miguel. I think the biggest thing that we need is awareness, right? So getting people, um, and maybe that might be starting at the grassroots. So like starting with regular, ordinary people, the public because I think they're gonna be easier to convince to at least try other alternatives. Um, and if, if they, and so then, then the other side is the pest control, the professional pest control, right? Well, a lot of these um, businesses and houses and um, residences are, um, uh, pe regular people are hiring uh, pest control to come in. So maybe we can um, equip them to be, to ask questions. And a lot of times I know from just hearsay and, and talking to people, um, the companies will outright lie to them and say, oh, there's no effects on this. Um, you know, it, it's safe, it's perfectly safe. It's, um, and it's just not true. Um, there's also in the US, um, so I'm in the United States, sorry, I didn't say that, I'm in Texas. Um, and so each state is very different, but um, uh, by law, uh, you, uh, national law, you're supposed to have a label. So if on the bait box, it's supposed to have the type of, compound that's in there and in Texas no boxes are labeled so there's a lot of um we're not as progressive as California here but maybe we're kind of in the middle because maybe we're uh, we're, st we're starting to um at least get the word out but um you're saying Miguel like try to make noise that's what I'm trying to do so <laughs> you know Dr. Smith I work with Dr. Smith so we're you know we've been working on that and um um, so we'll just keep doing that, but I would like to also know, um, Betsy, if you have, I'll give you my information because if you have access to, um, or if you know even techniques, uh, that they're using to test in-house that like, you know, could, instead of the expensive tests, that would be really beneficial because we could start testing, um, all the birds here in Texas as well. And, um, I think, um, Texas, is, there's a little problem here because, uh, up until now, or up until the th my thesis, there were no results. So we didn't know uh, whether or not, you know, official, we didn't have official evidence that this was happening. So um, we had a small sample size, so I'm hoping to get more. So again, if something like that, that test would really be beneficial because then we could just really um, do it at the rehab centers here. And um, I think that's all I wanted to say, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Miguel, you have your hand. Uh, right. Oh, yeah, I think <laughs> I wanted to say something. The, one of the, the issues is, is uh, we, we certainly rely on rehabilitation centers a lot because they tell us, or they usually provide the first uh, signal or, in, or they provide information about what's going on out there, you know? We, we only see the tip of the iceberg. We only see the clinical cases, the animals that they have been somehow unable to fly. And that's only showing the tip of the iceberg. What is going on on the pre-ranging raptor population? What is going on in other animal species that they are not raptors? You know, we still don't know that. And and you know, we we want to do this type of studies, but I think that even without knowing, and I didn't want to leave before saying that because 
even if we don't have the, the information, we know the problem exists. The, 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 we can start with um, looking for alternatives, educating people, educating the uh, manufacturing companies, the sellers, the pest control people, trying to educate the governments, the local, national, state governments. We can start doing that. We can start working together and spreading the word about this problem that is worldwide, obviously. If it happens, if we have evidence, already confirmed evidence that happened in Australia, Asia, Africa, Europe, and North America. We are just not looking at it, but that's not because we don't have it. So we can start working. And I hope that this type of uh, interactions will help us to, to, to create some sort of working group or something that will start maybe moving this issue. We have so many problems in conservation. And, and this is one more. And the idea was, let's put it a little bit more in evidence. And, and we were working on this for two or three years, trying to move these samples and, and it was impossible. The issue of regulation between countries, you know, we need to work on that, how we move biological samples without putting in risk the national food supply in any country by getting them a, or giving them a virus. But we also need to find ways to, you know, if you have a center that can do different tests, you, you mentioned Texas, I was in Texas AIM. In the lab there, they can run everything. And there are many places like that in the world. So we, we should find ways to, to improve the access for us for, uh, or for those in, in, in countries where we don't have these uh, wildlife uh, laboratories and, and facilities to get access. So we can start looking at this problem with, in, in the frame of evidence-based research and medicine. So that, that what I wanted to say, sorry about But I, I think, I also think that we need to make it, as you say, we need to, to talk a lot more about this. I live in an area that's um, being developed and there are a lot of houses that are being under construction right now. And a way to control the rats that are here. I mean, we do have, um, rats and we have also um, guinea, like the guinea pigs, um, the uh, quises, and um, they put these black boxes as you were showing Miguel. And so I think that, uh, and we have a lot of car cars flying around. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, this is happening here. Um, but I'm also pretty sure that people don't know at least the, um, the developer doesn't know that that they're causing a problem, like an indirect problem by putting these boxes there. So I think that right. talking about this more and actually trying to work on strategies uh, in for these different um, scenarios, right? You have a um, place that's being developed. How do we control the population of rats there? You have, as we were saying before with Valeria, uh, suburban areas in Patagonia. How do you control there? The it's not rats. It's another type of rodent population. So um, try to develop. To, if we start talking about these things, to try to develop different um, guidelines um, for controlling under different scenarios, it might be helpful too. But we need help for many people to do that. I agree. Yeah. Miguel, you want to read the comments? That's very specific for bats. Oh, I just mentioned that there are different approaches you now for treatment of this patient, but there are so many clinical situations, and this is not a veterinary uh, forum, so we didn't want to talk too much. But those that are into the veterinary medicine field and, and they want to talk about this, feel free to contact me. We also have here, I think, Dr. Guillermo Wimeyer. Hola, Guillermo. <laughs> and, and also Dr. Pablo Plaza, and I don't know if there is any other veterinarian here, but uh, besides Betsy too, so please, uh, yeah, I know you are, so please uh, contact us if you want to discuss it. But um, Don't contact me, please. And, and we have Dr. Barbara Bartolomé. <laughs> Barbara, good to see you too. She, she works in Patagonia too. So, but the, the point is that 
the birds that get into clinical problems, you know, treatment is kind of uh, difficult and they're always associated pathology. But the point here is, is how we can start changing what's going on and, and at least identifying the problem. I think we are still dealing with the same problems. Lead has been 35, 40 years of discussion about lead problems, lead ammunition. Yeah. Still is a, a steady problem in, in many places. So it's really difficult to, to modify things, but we need to try, no? That's, that's what we all do, try. So uh, Jen just suggested to have a rodenticide meeting at our meeting in Bolivia. So for those of you who don't know, um, Association of Field Ornithologists will be having a joint meeting with the Neotropical Ornithological Society, the Brazilian Ornithological Society, the Bolivian Ornithological Society, and we have partners uh, that are collaborating from Aves Argentinas and Colombia and Cipamex in Mexico also. And um, we are meeting in August next year uh, in Santa Cruz de la Sierra. So I actually think that would be a great idea to have a symposium and roundtable discussion or some or working group or something about this um, at that meeting. I think it's a great idea, Jen. I think these are great meetings to spread the word. Because yeah, too. most people working, you know, I have been working with raptors, Valeria too, Jaime Jimenez here, also here, uh, Guillermo, working with raptors for a long, long time. And still, we are not looking at these problems. And there are many others too, no? but I think yeah. that will be a great venue to discuss and, and spread the word. I, I, I'm signing for it. <laughs> we'll try to go. It's August 1 to 4. <laughs> I remember correctly. <laughs> Uh, 2023 in Santa Cruz de la Sierra. <laughs> thanks for this, this news. Well, thanks for this space. It, it For me, it was a great experience. I was kind of nervous because of the English, but but now I'm relaxed. So, <laughs> so it, it, it's a nice experience. I'm very productive too. Yes. Oh. Um, one thing that we didn't tell the, the, the presence is uh, that uh, we wrote a small but high impact note that will be published um, in science as a letter mm -hmm. next week it, on the, no, the other week uh, yeah. on the, on the, yeah, on the issue, 2 of September. So okay. Next week. Uh, well, I, I don't know what, what's the date now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> next I read week. it about the language, right? Yes, <laughs> it's a very, very small, short, it's a three paragraphs, but it just to alert that at least in Argentina, we are in this bad uh, state of the art situation with the, with the, with the topic. So yeah, that I was Miguel's great. idea. That's a great idea. I had a, um, one last question, if I may. Yes, uh, sure. I don't know if there has been like a follow up in the different islands where um, rodenticides have been applied to eradicate rodents. And uh, if there, for example, South Georgia, uh, where there was a very successful experience in eliminating rodenticides, which, you know, made the comeback of a number of different species of birds and other smaller islands throughout the world. And if there has been a follow-up as to the long-term effects mm -hmm. of, for example, Brodifacum, which is uh, principally one of the rodenticides of, uh, that has been used, has been applied in these, in these uh, projects. Maybe that would be also a way to address and see, um, or even ask to uh, find out, you know, what happened in those places where these, uh, these actions you know, were long-term and have been successful in controlling the rodents, but we don't know uh, what have been the effects on, for example, the other species of animals. Yeah. In Galapagos, they have been using, they have been controlling the rodents to try to get them, get rid of them off them in, in Galapagos Island. And, and there they have a unique species endemic to the Galapagos, the Galapagos hawk. And there have been, I, I am aware of uh, secondary poisoning on, on some of them. And in South Georgia, we don't have raptors. In theory, there are no raptors. Uh, okay. I will 
I would like to go there and spend some time looking for them, but apparently there are no raptors. And probably they will be only, uh, they, I'm not sure really, but maybe Valeria knows more about it. I have a friend who may know more, Ulysses Balsa. But mm. I'm not sure if there are many other really the other and uh, carnivores, but uh, there were a huge rat infestation there. I, I and the use so yeah, Iceland is a particular situation, and and I I will never say that uh, I will probably know how to do it. I have my ideas about how it can be done, but every situation is different, and and there are a lot of information out there if somebody needs help searching for information let me know i can put you in contact with people who in many years ago i was invited to be part of the eradication plan of rodents in galapagos and it was not feasible for me for different options different situations uh, and reasons but um i know the people who have been involved and i can easily put you in contact with them and you can discuss because every island is is a it's a different world there are different reptiles, insects. So Jaime, you have a question too. Yeah, it's just a comment, a uh, follow up from your comment. So first, uh, congratulations, Valeria, and good to see you and uh, Miguel and Betsy and a lot of uh, known people. So, and Laura, also I know your papers. And my, okay. my comment was related to the fact that in Chile, there is a big problem on Juan Fernandez Island and the high officers in CONAF they wanted to eradicate rodents and perhaps the big issue of having rabbits there with rodenticides. And there are short eared owls there, kestrels and uh, red-backed hawks, a subspecies. So it's a big issue. I was involved in a very hot discussion with them. So I don't know if this will move forward, but we would like to uh, make the jump and contact Miguel in that regard and how dangerous that might be. And before moving into actions, we need to be cautious and, and uh, ha examine the issue very uh, carefully before the next step, because it could be a disaster for many species, right. not just for raptors, but even uh, insects. And I don't know if they have the same pathway, but uh, a lot of uh, other trophic levels are involved in this uh, uh, process of removing carcasses and, and things like that. So just that and, and greetings from Denton, but I'm representing Chile. <laughs> <laughs> That's there a great comment. Come on. And I always say that, you know, <laughs> I, don't know how many you, <laughs> I don't know how many of you remember the Avengers movie, but at one point, Dr. Strange creates or replicates multiple scenarios in his head, trying to find the solution to the problem of, of the, the villain. Thanos, and, and that's what sometimes needs to be done before actions are taken. Sometimes we you, people need to brainstorm and consider any single possibility, any scenario, you know, evaluate all the possibilities before making decisions. And even after that, there are room for mistakes or, or, or problems. And, and that's something that I think is the most important thing. Every action uh, aimed to to control or eradicate or eliminate or manage wildlife needs to have a lot of brainstorming. If after that there are uh, errors or, or collateral effects, we can never say that will never happen, but they, every, this, every decision needs to be very carefully considered and discussed and brainstormed. So in this way, you know, I, I will agree with Jaime about the concerns uh, of doing this sort of eradication programs when there are so many raptors there, you know, and you need to, and, and especially in, it's a large island, uh, some other island, and on maybe smaller, you know, you may even able to capture some of the animals there and then release them again and keep them away from the poison. But there are so many variables and uh, to consider. And I am far from being a knowledgeable person, but uh, I remember brainstorming a little bit about this and. I think this is the most important thing. Try to think about every single scenario and, and try to prevent, prevent them. Well, thank you very much. It's almost 43 minutes past the hour. <laughs> this was a great conversation to have, um, but we need to finish um, our talk and actually have my son right behind me. <laughs> um, so um, we are going to leave the email addresses of the presenters 
uh, either on our website. Yeah, he's, he's here <laughs> on our website or um, on our YouTube channel. And then um, you can be in touch with each other if you're interested. But thank you so much. This was super interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Fosby! <laughs> 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 ideas. <laughs> <laughs>